Not a sight officials want to see oil gushing out of a massive storage tank at a Texas refinery today. So much oil poured out, authorities had to close nearby roads, and the refinery started monitoring the air in the nearby community as a precaution. Tonight, cleanup is underway, and it's not yet clear what caused the spill. This, of course, comes as fallout grows from that massive Southern California oil spill. The Coast Guard is calling it a major marine casualty. And new questions tonight after officials say it took the company three hours to shut down the pipeline after the alarm sounded and another three hours to report it. Our Matt Gutman presses officials with the company about what took so long. Tonight, sadly, we are tracking the aftermath of another school shooting in America. Four injured at a Texas school. Teenagers seen sheltering in classrooms, teachers blocking the doors, authorities identifying the alleged gunman, an 18-year-old student who is now in custody. Tonight, what we're learning about what may have sparked the shooting. The new vaccine mandate in America's second largest city requiring everyone to show proof of full vaccination or a test before going inside most businesses, including restaurants, bars, theaters, gyms, and shopping malls. Also, AstraZeneca hoping to get FDA authorization on a drug cocktail that could help prevent COVID. Tonight, the debt ceiling showdown in Washington with America's economy on the line and late breaking news about a possible deal between Democrats and Republicans to temporarily prevent the country from defaulting on its bills. On the heels of that Facebook whistleblower, our report about the potential dangers of social media filters. Are they creating a warped sense of beauty? I am someone who grew up on the internet and it totally skewed with my sense of confidence. Do you think we've completely lost touch with what a real body and a real face actually look like? I do feel like we're losing touch with what reality looks like and it hurts me because I feel like reality is beautiful. It's known as the hardest working river in the West. 40 million people rely on its water. But tonight we travel to the Colorado River, which is disappearing fast and putting lives and livelihoods at stake, forcing communities into tough decisions. What the natural system is telling us right now is, is a blazing alarm to change our relationship to water, to conserve across all sectors, to innovate. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight, sadly, with yet another school shooting in America. It is the second shooting inside a Texas school in the span of just a week and the 22nd shooting with injuries or deaths at a school this year alone. The scenes now seem far too familiar. Active shooter training kicking in, students huddling behind desks, teachers barricaded in classrooms. Three students and one teacher were hurt. It happened at Timberview High School in Arlington, which is in the Dallas metro area. Police say it began as a confrontation between two students and likely in the heat of the moment. The suspected gunman was quickly identified as an 18-year-old student there tonight. He is in police custody. After the scene was secured, the work of accounting for everyone began, buses taking students to a performance center to be reunited with their parents. Marcus Moore leads us off tonight from Arlington. Tonight, a shooting at this Arlington, Texas high school, leaving four people hurt. This is not a random act of violence. This is not somebody attacking our schools. Officials saying it all started around 9.15 this morning. Authorities now reviewing videos posted to social media appearing to show a fight. We believe right now, preliminary, that it was a student that got into a fight and drew a weapon. All you hear is pop. Like six shots, six, seven shots back to back. This is something you all have done drills on. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, we do drills on it all the time, so we knew what to do. Once we heard lockdown, because usually they say, usually they let us know it's a drill, but they say lockdown, lockdown, so we knew it wasn't no drill. Police identifying the suspect as 18-year-old Timothy George Simpkins, a Timberview High School student who turned himself in after an hours-long manhunt. Students sheltering in place. Teacher Dale Topham was just down the hall with his students, and together they barricaded the door. And they realized there was shooting. There was no hesitation, no confusion, no chaos. They just immediately sprang into action. One 25-year-old teacher and three teenage students were wounded during the shooting, three of them taken to the hospital and expected to be okay. As an all-out manhunt for Simpkins began, and law enforcement swarming his house with guns drawn, but he wasn't there. Officials out with a warning. This person is considered to be armed and dangerous. As the lockdown was lifted at the high school, a steady stream of students walking out in a single file. And a now familiar scene tonight. Worried parents waiting to be reunited with their children, 
This is the fifth school shooting in the past week. This mom saying that she and her son had discussed school shootings and prepared for this day. To know that the shooting was right next to his class, bullets fly everywhere. Just chilling that this is something that students now have to prepare for these days. Marcus Moore joins us from outside of that high school. Any word from authorities on a motive tonight, Marcus? Well, Lindsay, they continue to investigate just behind me. You can see that scene, and, and there's no word from authorities on a motive, but they say they found a possible weapon, a 45 caliber handgun found in the middle of the street about two miles from here, and Simpkins has been charged with three counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, and he's expected to make a court appearance tonight. Lindsay. Marcus Moore, our thanks to you. Next tonight to that major oil spill, the pipeline company facing some tough questions after officials say that it took three hours to shut down the pipeline after the alarm sounded and another three hours to report it. Tonight, the oil company is disputing that timeline. Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman reports. Tonight, the company that operates that cracked oil pipeline facing tough questions as we learn more about those critical first hours of the spill. Official reports showing a ship offshore first spotted a sheen in the water around 6 p.m. Friday and called in a report about two hours later. But according to a letter obtained by ABC News from federal regulators to Amplify Energy, the company first recorded a low pressure alarm indicating a possible failure at 2.30 a.m. Saturday and did not shut down the pipeline for another three and a half hours. And then the company only notified the Coast Guard six hours after that initial alarm leading to questions about why it took so long for Amplify's alarms to go off. Isn't that something that is most elemental in any sort of pipeline facility? Noticing when there's a significant loss of pressure such that... I'm not sure if there was a significant loss of pressure, but we will fully investigate this. It was something the size of Central Park that was spotted by a satellite at just before 7 p.m. on Friday evening. If we were aware of something on Friday night, we, I promised you we would have immediately stopped all operations. It's believed at least 30,000 gallons, but possibly more than 144,000 gallons spilled into what is designated an ecologically unusually sensitive area. A lot of this work is painstaking. It has to be done by hand. That's why the governor of California said he's assembling was basically going to become an army of cleanup workers, 1,500 of them by the end of today. Still, wildlife oiled and livelihoods jeopardized. With harbors locked down by the Coast Guard, Scott Brenneman, who owns a fish market in Newport Beach, Freshest you can buy. telling me business is down 90%. People are scared to come to the beach. They're scared to buy local seafood. They assume that it's contaminated. Easy to understand why people are so concerned. Matt Gutman joins us now live from the Huntington Beach Pier, where authorities just spoke, and the company is now disputing federal regulators' timeline. And not only are they disputing their timeline, Lindsay, they're also disputing the basic narrative. Federal regulators said that an alarm sounded in the control room of that oil company, uh, alerting them of low oil pressure. That means there's a big, blaring problem. The company says no alarm sounded whatsoever. And despite the fact that NOAA satellites seem to have picked up a giant Central Park-sized plume at around 7 p.m. the night before, the company says the first it heard or saw of the oil spill was when officials on that rig physically saw oil, that's when they shot everything down. That's more than 12 hours later. So there's a major discrepancy here and a major gap in the timeline. Lindsay. I'm sure we will get to the bottom of that. Matt Gutman, our thanks to you. Next to the political battle in Washington over raising the debt limit to prevent the U.S. from defaulting on its bills after weeks of stalemate between Republicans and Democrats on working together to avoid an economic disaster, late today, a potential breakthrough. Here's ABC's Rachel Scott on Capitol Hill. Tonight, Senate Republicans and Democrats striking a temporary deal to prevent the American economy from going over a cliff. Hopefully, Republicans will be more reasonable in the next couple of months. The nation will default on its loans two weeks from today. If Congress fails to raise the debt ceiling, it's never happened before, and the potential consequences would be devastating. My Republican friends need to stop playing Russian roulette with the U.S. economy. Earlier today, President Biden, business leaders and top officials sounding the alarm. We would likely experience a recession. Millions of jobs would be lost. Millions of seniors who depend on Social Security for their support would have to make awful choices, such as deciding whether to pay rent or buy groceries. Interest rates would soar. The stock market would crater.
JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon predicting a complete catastrophe for the global economy. Raising the debt ceiling used to be a standard bipartisan vote, but now Republicans want Democrats to own it heading into the midterm elections. This, although 98 percent of the current debt was created before President Biden took office, 7.8 trillion of it during the Trump years when the parties voted to raise the debt ceiling three times. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell didn't mention any of that today. But the Democrats who run Washington have done nothing. They've squandered week after week after week. McConnell not mincing any words there. Rachel Scott joins us now. And Rachel, so what are Democrats in the White House saying tonight about this potential short-term extension? Many at home are going to perceive this as just kicking the can down the road. Yeah, it's exactly that. This is really only a temporary fix. Congress will have to revisit this issue in the next several weeks. At the same time, lawmakers will also be trying to avert a government shutdown. All this, as we know, Democrats are still trying to get through President Biden's economic agenda. Lawmakers here on Capitol Hill certainly have their work cut out for them, but we really are in the same place. Congress just pushing back this string of deadlines until the end of the year, Lindsay. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. Now to the pandemic and the sobering statistic that more Americans have now died of COVID this year than in all of 2020, despite the widespread availability of vaccines. And now the city of Los Angeles is joining New York and extending the need for proof of vaccination to more indoor venues in the hopes of containing the spread, even as some Americans still resist taking the vaccine. ABC's Kaylee Hartung has the latest. Tonight, the city of Los Angeles passing a sweeping new vaccine mandate Customers will now need to show proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test, not only at bars, clubs, and big events, but also at indoor restaurants, gyms, shopping malls, nail salons, movie theaters, and venues like the Staples Center, starting November 4th. L.A. joining New York to become one of the strictest cities in the nation. Hairstylist Fred Hertz knows he may lose customers, but he sees the new rules as a way out of the pandemic. Now the city of L.A. is saying you must require proof of vaccination. And but, you'll ask without hesitancy. Yes, I will. I've been hoping kind of for this to happen because it needs this needs to stop. This needs to stop. It's getting out of control. But for weeks, thousands of workers protesting vaccine mandates from employers have been willing to lose their jobs. And tonight, some Americans could face even more dire consequences for not getting the shot. In Colorado, Leilani Lutali has stage 5 kidney disease, but she can't get a transplant as long as she and her donor are unvaccinated. It feels a little bit like uh, my transplant is being held hostage and there's only one decision that I'm being left with. In a letter, UC Health giving Leilani and her donor 30 days to get the shot or be removed from the list. The hospital pointing out that transplant patients are already required to get vaccines. And if infected with COVID, they are at particularly high risk of severe illness, hospitalization, and death. The mortality risk is high as 32%. But Leilani and her donor don't want the vaccine for religious reasons. It's not going to change my mind. I want a, I want a choice to be able to make as, as being a partner in my own health care. Tonight, the number of new COVID cases are falling, but already this year, a staggering toll. 353,000 lives lost to COVID in 2021, more than in all of 2020. We're intubating and losing people. Federal health officials out with a new PSA campaign featuring COVID, COVID survivors making the case for the vaccine. Been in the hospital for 76 days now. They gave me a 5% chance of living. So I highly recommend everybody to get the vaccines and really protect themselves because this is no joke. Still trying to convince people to get vaccinated. Kaylee Hartung joins us now. And Kaylee, President Biden has been promising to ramp up production of rapid testing kits. And today the White House announced some progress there before the end of the year. Yeah, Lindsay, the White House announcing a $1 billion investment, saying they're now finally in position to quadruple the availability of rapid tests, ramping up production to $200 million per month by December. And officials say a new test coming to the market called FlowFlex, it was just authorized on Monday, will help ease the supply crunch and could be available for less than $10 a test. Lindsay? Oh, that'll be significant development. And AstraZeneca also has applied for FDA emergency use authorization for a new antibody cocktail treatment to prevent COVID. What's so significant about this? 
Yeah, so Lindsay, the U.S. has already authorized two different but similar products, one from Eli Lilly, the other from Regeneron, but AstraZeneca says their drug combination will be different from those because it will be longer lasting. And if authorized, it'll be used to, to prevent COVID among the highest risk among us, the people who are immunocompromised, those for whom the vaccines don't work. But keep in mind, this treatment is not a replacement for the vaccine, Lindsay. Understood. Kaylee Hartung, our thanks to you. We're joined now by Dr. Alok Patel, a physician at Stanford Children's Health. Thank you so much for joining us, doctor. Good to be here. Thank you. So Kaylee reported there on the city of Los Angeles extending requirements for proof of full vaccination or a negative COVID test to more indoor venues starting in November. How effective are these types of requirements, do you think, in both containing the spread of the virus and also encouraging vaccination? Well, I actually think they're they're very useful in terms of both of what you mentioned. So in terms of containing it, we finally have a venue where people can actually see a tangible benefit to getting vaccinated. If preventing hospitalization or death is not enough, people at least see some type of endpoint saying, hey, if I'm vaccinated, I can go back into a restaurant or a bar and take my mask off and party like it's 2019. But another thing that I'm personally and my colleagues are seeing happening from vaccine mandates is it's forcing people to actually have a dialogue, to go and talk to their friends, to go talk to their community community members and their, their primary care physicians and saying, okay, guess what? I now need to get off the fence and make a decision. What should I do? And that on its own is very important in driving people to go and get the shot. And on the issue of mandates, we're, we're still seeing hesitance among so many Americans, including in, in some healthcare workers in hospitals around the country. Kaiser Permanente says that they've suspended more than 2,000 employees who haven't gotten vaccinated yet. Why do you think that this has become an issue for hospitals, given all these workers have seen of the, the impact of the pandemic? Well, one thing I want to clarify when we see these headlines about healthcare workers being hesitant is that the vast majority of frontline healthcare workers who were fighting this pandemic in 2020 and even now are actually vaccinated. Over 95% of physicians in this country have gotten vaccinated, and the American Nursing Association estimates that about 90% of nurses have as well. But here's the thing when we talk about people who work in healthcare, that represents the entire demographic of Americans. And so it's not surprising to me if you look at statistics that there's going to be a proportion who are hesitant for a whole host of reasons. Some say they don't trust the vaccine. Some still don't think COVID's a big deal. And some are citing personal or philosophical reasons. And it's unfortunate that a minority are choosing, you know, their jobs or their own personal beliefs over the benefit from getting a vaccine. And it's also unfortunate that those minority tend to have the largest megaphones. And bottom line, have government and employer mandates been effective in boosting vaccination rates since they started rolling out? According to the data, they have been. And if you actually look at the data, even with, with some of the airlines that have done it and school districts, they have been effective in getting people to get out there and get the shot. And it's been effective in, in healthcare as well, not only in California, but also in New York, places that are starting to mandate shots for healthcare workers. More and more healthcare workers who are on the fence have gone out to go get the vaccine. So the mandates are working. It's just, it's also starting to turn this into more of a boiling point for people out there who are arguing about their, their medical freedom. But the one thing that has to be clear is vaccine mandates are nothing new. They've been around for decades. In the state of California, for example, children need 10 vaccines to go from childcare through K through 12. And so COVID-19 vaccine mandate should not be viewed as an isolated mandate. It's just falling into a group of ones that have been established for years in this country. And here's something that I found really interesting. There are also reports of a Colorado health system now denying organ transplants to patients in most situations who are not vaccinated, citing that studies show those patients are much more likely to die if they get COVID. As a medical professional, what's your take on whether this is the right approach? Well, my take is if I were to look at what happens when people are listed on the organ transplant list, it's very complicated. And so I wouldn't want someone to look at this, this case in Oregon, or I'm sorry, in Colorado and say, oh, they're denying people simply because of their choice about the vaccine. Organ transplants are very risky. And in any case, they're going to go ahead and look at the people who are listed for an organ transplant, look at everything in terms of do they smoke? What does their underlying health look like? What's their best chance of survival after they go and get this new organ? Because it's a limited supply. So it does make sense that there's this rationing that's going to happen. And we know that COVID-19 is going to specifically affect those who are on those immunosuppressive medications after they get a transplant. So yes, it does seem tragic and it does seem like a difficult decision, but it's a necessary one. 
And big picture, we recently, of course, crossed that milestone of 700,000 Americans who have died from COVID. And even with vaccines now widely available, more Americans have already died this year than in 2020. But we are starting to see a drop in both cases as well as deaths. So where do you think that we stand right now on, on getting on the right trajectory as we head toward the holidays? Well, I'm hoping that we are slowing how quickly we go from 700,000 to potentially 750,000. Because what's really gut-wrenching is that we were at 600,000 in the middle of June when we had vaccines available. And we got to 100,000 more deaths in three and a half months. And right now we're almost normalizing. I shouldn't say we, but a lot of people out there are normalizing the fact that we're still having about 1,800 deaths a day. So it's my hope that with over 70% of Americans who've gotten a shot, on top of the amount of natural immunity that exists out there, on top of all the new medications that are coming out and you know the ability for healthcare professionals to recognize COVID-19 early, that we're going to slow the amount of deaths that we're seeing. And we're going to have a very different holiday season than we did last year. But we certainly aren't out of the woods yet. We still have about 70 million Americans who aren't vaccinated who are at risk still. We are These people are, should not be running around and acting like the pandemic's over because it's not. And lastly, on another major health development today, the WHO announced that they're recommending the broad use of the world's first malaria vaccine. Just put into context the significance of that for global public health, especially for children around the world. This is a huge victory for global public health. You know, we live in this sheltered bubble called the developed first world. And COVID-19 to many people was the very big first infectious disease epidemic. But to put this in perspective, in 2019, over 400,000 people died globally from malaria. And 60, about 60 to 70% of those deaths were in children. And the 95% of these cases happened in sub-Saharan Africa, where they're limited in terms of their health care resources. So this new vaccine that came out, you know, it's showing in early trials and in clinical trials about a 30 to 40 percent efficacy. Now, some might say, hey, that's not a lot. But guess what? When you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of children being affected every single year, that is a big difference. And according to the World Health Organization, this may prevent 20 to 30,000 deaths a year in children under the age of five. So you take in this vaccine plus access to health care, plus bed nets, plus all of it, all the layered protection. And this is a very, very big moment in public health and in the fight against malaria. Dr. Alok Patel of Stanford Children's Health, we thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. And when we come back, the police officer under investigation after cell phone video emerged, appearing to show him harassing a man walking home. Are social media filters changing the way we look at ourselves? But up next, it's one of the most important rivers in the entire country, and it's disappearing, forcing some communities to make some tough calls. Stay with us. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people this squeezing into this bomb shelter. shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast apps.
sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. The a family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc. Subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. This was the scene in Chicago after a construction crane came down next to an apartment building on the city's north side. At least one car was crushed in the incident and commuter train service was temporarily suspended because it landed on train tracks. But fortunately, no word of any injuries. Now tonight to what some are calling a blazing alarm to change our relationship with water. The 40 million Americans who rely on the Colorado River are facing the prospect of their water running dry. And tonight, farmers are worried about their livelihoods for good reason. Arcana Whitworth traveled to the southern part of the river in Arizona, where Native Americans are now trying to help their neighbors and save the river they love. The Colorado River, known as the hardest working river in the West, passing through 11 different national parks and monuments, touching seven states. The water is crucial to cities and agriculture alike, pumping $1.4 trillion into the economy each year. And it's disappearing fast. It's going to affect everybody that I do business with. Now, the 40 million people that rely on the Colorado River for water are hearing the warning. I haven't even really figured out because I don't know how much water I'm gonna have, so I don't really know what I'm gonna grow yet next year. Paco Ullerton has been tilling his Arizona soil for over 40 years. Now, in dire drought, he's facing some tough choices. This field we're walking by right here and the one over here to our left, these two fields on this farm will probably not get irrigated next year. So I'm gonna lose- You'll have nothing growing here next year? Most likely. Agriculture accounts for over 70% of water consumption in the state of Arizona. And farmers like Paco stand to lose access to 65% of their main irrigation source, Central Arizona Project Water, water pumped from the Colorado. 2023, we won't have any cap water is what it means. In August, the federal government declared the first ever water shortage for the lower Colorado River Basin. The drought so bad, communities must now prepare to ration water. We are seeing the effects of climate change in the Colorado River Basin, and now is the time to take action to respond to them. The changing climate putting the future of these farmers in peril. They don't have the same water security that their parents and their grandparents had. So they're doing the best they can to adapt to less water. So you've already taken the step to try to conserve water by installing a drip system at a cost to you. And still, you're not going to be able to harvest this field. No, we won't plant it next year. The system we put in 20 years ago, and, we've, and we're still trying to refine it with technology, moisture probes, aerial imagery, infrared inf imagery, watching, trying to save, learn if we can save some more water, not only with the drip, which we've saved considerably the amount of water, 35% yeah. over what we used to do on this farm when it was furrow irrigated. And we use less fertilizer, a whole bunch, a lot less labor. It's, it's, it's just incredible. This is ground zero for climate change impacts on water in the United States, right here in the Colorado River Basin. What the natural system is telling us right now is, is a blazing alarm to change our relationship to water, to conserve across all sectors, to innovate. The lower basin serving the heavily populated areas of Las Vegas, Los Angeles, San Diego, Phoenix, and Tucson is of particular concern. It's an example of a region starting to deal with crisis. That's where we are. The flows in the Colorado River have declined 20% since 2000. And climate scientists tell us to prepare for additional declines of between 14 and 31% by 2050. Recent projections have warned water levels could decline so much within the next few years, it could threaten power generation from Lake Mead and Lake Powell that millions rely on. 
29 tribes also depend on the Colorado River water and have legal claims to it. The Colorado River Indian tribes, or CRIT, now power players in this drought emergency, trying to answer the plea for help. CRIT's responsibility is to save the life of this river. The river has taken care of us for many, many years. Uh, our reservation is, um, uh, was created in 1865, but it goes beyond that. It's taken care of us, so now we have to do our part. CRIT is made up of Mojave, Chimuevi, Hopi, and Navajo tribes, and Amelia Flores is the first ever female to be elected chairwoman of the tribal council. Oh, yeah. They have rights to water from the river dating back to 1968 and made the drastic decision to save water by fallowing some of their farmland, leaving it bare with no crops at all. Tribes have never been included in, in the decision making and the policies. So this is another way that we can um, stay strong and be a voice. And, and in this way, in the drought, we can be a voice and be able to, um, to offer we can be a voice for the people and we can be a voice for our land. The Colorado River Indian tribes have nearly 75,000 acres of irrigated farmland. But over here, you can see a chunk of the some 10,000 that they followed. By the end of 2022, their three-year agreement will add 150,000 acre feet of water to Lake Mead, which has fallen to its lowest levels since it was built in 1930. That much water is supporting 400,000 people every year and helping the state avoid even more drastic cuts. In return, the tribes will be paid $38 million. It's a model of collaborative solutions is it was funded by environmental NGOs, private corporations, uh, state governments, and it required the tribe to do new things and, and, and make new commitments. That's the kind of multi-sector innovative approach we're gonna need on an even bigger scale if we're gonna make it through this era. These pumps are used to send this water across the state to places like Yuma, Arizona, which grows about 90% of all the leafy vegetables grown in the U.S. during the winter. And starting next year, farmers, including those in Pinal County, will lose at least one-third of the Colorado River water they've depended on for decades. The impacts are going to hit the agricultural community the largest. That's and huge. It is huge. Of water. It's a big hit for them, significant hit. And within a few years, they could lose it all. Where are we going to get our groceries from? Can I see farming going away? Yeah, unfortunately. In this part of the world, eventually at some point. Kana Whitworth, ABC News, Pinal County, Arizona. Our thanks to Kana for that. Still ahead here on Prime, the former Tesla employee speaking out exclusively to ABC News after winning a multi-million dollar settlement over claims that he faced racist abuse while on the job. If you have student loan debt, you'll want to stick around for news on a new Biden administration policy that could lead to debt relief for as many as half a million people. Kind of a bit random, but ever wondered how many nukes the U.S. has in its arsenal? Let me take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day from the U.S. Mint. Quarters have never looked so good. extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. The breaking news overnight. Emergency crews called to the town of Surfside. U.S. airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs? Don't. I was gonna say, oh my. Got it. And what to expect in the day ahead. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. 
Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. See why Sunday mornings, more and more Americans are now turning first to ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Welcome to This Week. Live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're gonna move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by no people squeezing into this bomb shelter. shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back, everyone. The Biden administration, in a reversal from the last administration, has decided to reveal how many nuclear weapons are in the U.S. stockpile. And U.S. officials say they want to help control the global spread of these weapons of mass destruction. We take a look by the numbers. 3,750, that's the number of U.S. nuclear weapons, which includes those in active status and in long-term storage as of September 2020, according to the State Department. This is a drop from the 3,805 a year prior. These seem like staggering numbers, but just for some perspective here, we had more than 10,000 nuclear weapons as recently as 2003, which isn't even a third of the more than 31,000 nuclear weapons that the U.S. possessed in 1967 at its peak. Still, the Soviet Union had more, 40,159 nuclear weapons at its peak in 1986. The U.S. has used nuclear weapons two times during wartime, Japan in 1945, and we, of course, hope that never happens again. Researchers at Michigan Tech say that firing more than 100 nuclear weapons could cause a so-called nuclear autumn that would blow back and kill your own people. But it only takes one nuclear weapon to destroy an entire city, potentially killing millions and jeopardizing the natural environment for future generations. And we still have lots to get to here on Crime Tonight. The juror dismissed from the high-profile Theranos trial. We'll explain why. And we examine the role social media, particularly Instagram, has had on how we view ourselves. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. There's an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. 
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is Bring all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people. No squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. In Texas, police say they have a suspect in custody following a high school shooting in Arlington. This is not a random act of violence. This is not somebody attacking our schools. This is a student, we believe right now, preliminary, that it was a student that got into a fight and drew a weapon. Arlington Police Assistant Chief Kevin Colby says the student at Timberview High School named a person of interest was located several hours after gunfire broke out in a classroom. Four people were injured. Police are still conducting an investigation, but say all students have been safely evacuated. The Biden administration is temporarily relaxing the rules of a student loan forgiveness program meant for those who work in public service. It's a fix to a program launched in 2007 that has rejected more than 90% of applicants due to its complicated rules. The Education Department announced it will drop the strictest restrictions through October 2022, making it possible for anyone who has made 10 years of payments to have their loans forgiven. As many as half a million people like teachers, military members and nurses could qualify for the relief. New developments in the trial of Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes. A juror was excused from the entire trial due to religious conflicts. The juror said her Buddhist faith teaches love and compassion and that she has faced anxiety over the possibility of Holmes receiving punishment. Her replacement, an alternate juror, expressed some similar concerns but will remain on the jury. A Philadelphia police officer is under investigation tonight after cell phone video emerged on social media appearing to show him harassing a black man walking home on New Year's Day. Uh, let you tell it. Boy, you don't live down here. Let you tell it. Boy, where are you from? None of your business. Where are you from? The officer asking him, where are you from? Because you ain't from down here. The man claiming he was coming from his aunt's house. He was arrested for disorderly conduct not seen on video. The officer has been placed on administrative leave while the investigation continues. A former Tesla contract worker speaking out after a San Francisco federal court decided the electric car maker must pay him $137 million over claims he suffered racist abuse at the company. We just want to be just treated and seen as equal human beings. Owen Diaz, who was hired through a staffing agency in 2015 as an elevator operator at Tesla's factory in Fremont, told the court he faced a hostile work environment where employees drew swastikas and racist graffiti on bathroom stalls where co-workers told him to go back to Africa and ethnic slurs were heard routinely. Now, Tesla ordered to pay Diaz $130 million in punitive damages and $7 million in emotional distress, an unprecedented amount for racial discrimination cases. Disgraced singer R. Kelly has been banned from YouTube following his conviction on racketeering and sex trafficking charges last month. The two channels, R. Kelly TV and R. Kelly Vivo, went offline. He also won't be able to upload any videos in the future. The head of legal for YouTube stating this is all aimed to protect users and prevent widespread harm. The move is unusual for the video platform, but not unprecedented. YouTube has also removed accounts for influencer Austin Jones and Larry Nasser. Welcome back, everyone. Now to the battle over social media. Tonight, we look at those filters on platforms like Instagram that can radically change our online appearance. Are they contributing to what a Facebook whistleblower this week called a toxic environment for teens? Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef. 
They're not real, but they've never looked more lifelike. They can be fun, <laughs> sometimes a bit scary, oftentimes beautiful. Camera filters powered by augmented reality or AR at the fingertips of millions, able to give us that polished look. Some now asking, are filters creating a warped standard of beauty? I believe Facebook's products harm children, stoke division, and weaken our democracy. This week on Capitol Hill, Francis Haugen, a former product manager in civic integrity for Facebook, came forward testifying the tech giant knew about harmful effects caused by its apps, including Instagram's potentially toxic effect on some teenage girls, and did nothing. I would like to emphasize one of the documents that we sent in on problematic use examined the rates of problematic use by age, and that peaked with 14-year-olds. They say explicitly, I feel bad when I use Instagram and yet I can't stop. CEO Mark Zuckerberg breaking his silence, saying at the heart of these accusations is the idea that we prioritize profit over safety and well-being. That's just not true. He also wrote that research found that for many struggling teens, Instagram made those difficult times better rather than worse. Recently, a Kardashian family controversy sparking a national conversation. A non-filtered photo of Khloe Kardashian leaking to the public. Then, the predictable pattern of harsh critiques and comments followed. Days later, Khloe took to Instagram Live, showing off her body while lamenting the pressure she felt to always look a certain way online. I have an opinion about Khloe Kardashian and the leaked bikini photo. Azuga. With more than a million followers, TikTok sensation Teffy is known for her unvarnished opinions and says she prides herself on keeping it real. All right, this is filler, under eye filler, eyelash extensions. I am someone who grew up on the internet and it totally skewed with my sense of confidence. Do you think we've completely lost touch with what a real body and a real face actually look like? I do feel like we're losing touch with what reality looks like, and it hurts me because I feel like reality is beautiful. If a cyborg is half human and half technology, I feel like we're already getting there to the point where we're expecting people to look as unhuman as possible. The effects, even from some of the simplest filters, are astonishing. These filters can go from the cute, the sweet, to the ridiculous, but are they creating a false sense of what we should actually look like? Lenses and filters like these are available on most popular social media platforms from Snapchat to Instagram. Users can now virtually apply makeup or enhance their appearance. I don't try to go over the top because I don't want to change so much. Manuel, a top AR artist, went viral for his Grinch filter. But even with his quirky creations, this one called Patricia, his line of work also comes with pressure to meet a certain demand. Sometimes I, you know, follow, I'll say, the trend. Social psychologist Aaron Vogel says beauty filters can be alienating and create a sense of unattainable perfection. And getting used to seeing themselves that way because filters are so commonplace now. Experts say what starts out making you feel good can be damaging to self-esteem. We also get a self-esteem boost from other people's reactions. The American Academy of Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery cautions, while beauty filters can be fun, they've also contributed to a surge in demand for cosmetic procedures. 62% of plastic surgeons reported their patients wanted to go under the knife because of dissatisfaction with their social media profile. 57% said their patients wanted to look better in selfies on social media. The association warning if the results don't match that of a beauty filter, it could trigger body dysmorphia. I get a lot of young girls in my DMs, but and by young I mean like 13, 14, 15, that started to share with me they couldn't post a photo of themselves or a video to their Instagram stories or grid or anywhere on social media without a filter on. We reached out to Snapchat, a leader in AR filters, to see if they had any guidelines for usage. The company saying it rejects any lenses that mimic cosmetic surgery. Facebook, which owns Instagram, providing a similar statement, saying, We work closely with academics and organizations like the National Eating Disorders Association to develop policies 
policies that keep people safe and help those in need. For example, we ban effects that clearly promote eating disorders or that encourage potentially dangerous cosmetic surgery procedures. If people see these filters on the phones, they're going to want to look like the standard that we see even on TV. Even without filters, model Naomi is no stranger to fighting preconceived beauty standards. Last year, Instagram apologized for mistakenly flagging her semi-nude image because automatic censoring algorithms recognized her curvy body differently. In an industry known for airbrushing and touch-ups, she says putting these powerful tools in the hands of users as young as 13 can be a slippery slope. They can just change whatever they want, you know what I mean, and just continue to change things. Yeah, so that's dangerous in that sense. For Manuel, growing his platform means harnessing the opportunity to educate. I'm able now to set the trend and Instead of having a beauty filter, now we're going to have this learning filter, or we're going to have this game, or we're going to have this character. Talk to your children. You cannot disregard that it is affecting other people and how it might, how it might affect the people that you love around you, but you just haven't talked to them about it. We can close the magazine and we can pa drive past the billboard, but we are on our phones all the time. Ariel Reshef, ABC News, New York. Our thanks to Arielle for that. And for more on social media filters and the larger controversy surrounding Facebook and Instagram, we bring in Bloomberg News reporter Sarah Fryer, author of No Filter, the Inside Story of Instagram, which is now out in paperback. Thanks so much for joining us, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Ariel just reported on how social media filters can harm people's self-esteem, and a Facebook whistleblower is now saying that Instagram is particularly toxic to teens, a claim that Mark Zuckerberg is pushing back on. Who do you feel is right in this particular debate, Zuckerberg or his critics? Well, I think that the, the whistleblower, what she's really trying to point out is that these platforms work in ways that manipulate their users, and it's important that the public understand the mechanisms. Um, she does blame Mark, Mark Zuckerberg for not being transparent with that research, uh, it, Facebook's own research that showed that Instagram can have mental health impacts for teens, especially as Instagram starts to work on a product for even younger children. So, so I, I think that you know, it, it's not really a, a matter of who's right and wrong. It's a matter of the fact that this is an extremely powerful platform that is affecting the way young people uh, around the world view themselves and compare themselves to others. And I detailed in my book that there's a long history of their debate with what to do about the fact that Instagram does cause anxiety in all of its users. Now, Facebook has been accused of putting profits before people, something that the company and its CEO adamantly deny. You spent a good deal of time with the founders of Instagram, who famously sold their company to Facebook for a billion dollars. What was their motivation for starting Instagram? And do you think that these companies should be lumped together when we talk about business models? Well, Instagram started as a place to to make your make your photos look better and post them for other people. And and I think what was unique about it is it became a place where um, everything that you posted was a reflection of you. So it became the ultimate personal branding place. What happened when they joined Facebook, though? Uh, they were allowed to accelerate and grow, but once Instagram's growth started to to threaten Facebook's dominance, um, that was a problem for Mark Zuckerberg, and he started to restrict resources for Instagram. And and so I think that you know he is thinking of Facebook as the big profit driver. He's thinking of Instagram is supposed to be the tool that drives up the youth audience for Facebook Inc. So when you think of these companies, they're not separate companies anymore. Instagram is getting ever more integrated into Facebook corporate and becoming more Facebook-like in the process, and which means investing more in those tactics that increase engagement, increase time spent, a lot of which the Instagram founders were against when they were running Instagram because they thought that it cheapened the experience. And you write about the competition that Instagram faced and how the simplicity of the app was attractive to users. But in recent years, as you know, Instagram has added new features like stories, reels, and the ability to shop directly from the app. Do you think that that's a smart business plan, or, or could Instagram get too complicated for many users' taste? I think Instagram is already incredibly complicated, especially for new users to the platform. There's so many different ways that you can use this product. And I think that goes to show that what Instagram is doing now 
is it's trying to be that competitive Swiss army knife for Facebook, go after YouTube, go after TikTok, go after Snapchat in any way they possibly can. Uh, and in the process, losing a little bit of its way and solving business problems for Facebook, not necessarily solving problems for its users like that anxiety we talked about. And just out of curiosity, what's your own social media diet? I am, I, I'm on all these platforms because I use them to find people to lend insight to my reporting. Uh, I think that there is a way to use Instagram in, in an incredibly vibrant manner. Uh, I, I think that there, there can be a richness to social media. The problem is we as users are so passive in how we use it. We're letting the platform tell us what to look at um, and what to engage with when really we need to be informed about how these products work and and be mindful when we use them about what we what we actually intend to accomplish with that time as opposed to just mindless scrolling. And, and I hope my book sheds, sheds light on how, how it works and, and helps people make those decisions healthily. Yeah, and, and just to piggyback on that, having researched Instagram from the inside out, what advice would you give users on how to best use this and other social media platforms? I think go to it with an intention. You know, I'm on Instagram to uh, talk to my friends and family. Okay, well, then why did I get sucked into this rabbit hole of, of this content that I wasn't actually looking for because Facebook thought I would engage with it? I, I think it, it's very easy. You know, these products are not ones that we're going to with a purpose necessarily. We're going to them because we have a couple minutes before the microwave beeps or we have a, a few minutes before our Uber comes and we just want to be entertained. And that leaves us in a position to be to be manipulated very easily by whatever comes up first. And by understanding these algorithms, by understanding the incentives that Instagram and Facebook have to grow and how the tools that they use, the follower count, the comments, the likes are all in service of that growth. Um, it helps detach us from looking at Instagram as a reflection of our personal worth, looking at those metrics as indicators of whether we are relevant or successful or popular or interesting. I, I think that that uh, would help it become more popular, just a, a little bit more public education. And yes, uh, I agree with the whistleblower that the company needs to be more transparent. Sarah Fryer, thank you so much for your time. Her book, No Filter, The Inside Story of Instagram, is now available wherever books are sold. Before we go tonight, our image of the day. It is Fat Bear Week. That's a tournament that takes place in Alaska. This isn't about body shaming, but rather, according to the group that holds the event, a way to highlight the natural beauty of Katmai National Park and its bear population. Otis is this year's winner, all 480 pounds of him. Congrats to Otis. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, we're staying on top of a few things, including the new scrutiny being placed on the FBI over its handling of the Larry Nassar investigation. You may recall he was the former USA gymnastics doctor who sexually abused hundreds of young girls and women. And the major Supreme Court case looking at the brutal interrogations at so-called CIA black sites after 9-11, why the government is pushing to keep some of the details of what happened there a secret. This is what being live is Three all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're gonna move back, let's move back. We're surrounded this by people. Squeezing, squeezing into this bomb shelter. Run, urgent delivery, run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day.
What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The ladies you love. The hottest topics happening now. There's only one place to find it all. You guys are having the hard conversations. I love The View. The most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. A U.S. Marshal is in stable condition after being shot while serving a search warrant in Wisconsin. Police swarmed the scene and residents nearby were told to stay indoors. Police say the suspect took his own life. Our weather teams are tracking several severe storms sweeping across the south. Tornado watches are in effect for Alabama, Georgia, and Tennessee. Flash flood watches stretch from Florida to the Carolinas. And the NTSB is now joining the investigation into that major oil spill off the Southern California coast in Orange County. But there are new questions about why it took the company three hours to shut the pipeline down after alarms sounded. And now to that school shooting today in Arlington, Texas, the second shooting inside a Texas school in just one week. Police say it began as a confrontation between two students and likely in the heat of the moment. The suspected gunman is an 18-year-old student there, and tonight he's in police custody. Here's Marcus Moore. Tonight, a shooting at this Arlington, Texas high school, leaving four people hurt. This is not a random act of violence. This is not somebody attacking our schools. Officials saying it all started around 9.15 this morning. Authorities now reviewing videos posted to social media appearing to show a fight. We believe right now, preliminary, that it was a student that got into a fight and drew a weapon. All you hear is pop, pop, pop. Like six shots, six, seven shots back to back. This is something you all have done drills on. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, we do drills on it all the time, so we knew what to do once we heard lockdown. Because usually they say, usually they let us know it's a drill. But they said lockdown, lockdown. So we knew it was in our drill. Police identifying the suspect as 18-year-old Timothy George Simpkins, a Timberview High School student who turned himself in after an hours-long manhunt. Students sheltering in place. Teacher Dell Topham was just down the hall with his students, and together they barricaded the door. And they realized it was shooting. There was no hesitation, no confusion, no chaos. They just immediately sprang into action. One 25-year-old teacher and three teenage students were wounded during the shooting, three of them taken to the hospital and expected to be okay. As an all-out manhunt for Simpkins began, and law enforcement swarming his house with guns drawn, but he wasn't there. Officials out with a warning. This person is considered to be armed and dangerous. As the lockdown was lifted at the high school, a steady stream of students walking out in a single file. And a now familiar scene tonight. Worried parents waiting to be reunited with their children. This is the fifth school shooting in the past week. This mom saying that she and her son had discussed school shootings and prepared for this day. To know that the shooting was right next to his class, bullets fly everywhere. They're just so dangerous. Our thanks to Marcus. Now to the fallout over the FBI's handling of the investigation into former USA gymnastics doctor Larry Nasser. The Justice Department is now reconsidering whether the FBI agents who failed to properly investigate the sexual abuse claims against Nasser should have been charged themselves. ABC's Aika Jachi has the very latest. 
Today, the Justice Department says it's taking another look at the FBI agents accused of mishandling the sexual assault investigation into convicted former USA Gymnastics doctor Larry Nasser. The FBI has been facing harsh criticism for not doing enough to protect the young women. Tuesday, Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco now says new information is prompting the department to re-examine the actions of a few agents who are accused of ignoring claims and altering evidence. I want the survivors to understand how exceptionally seriously we take this issue um, and believe that uh, this deserves a, a thorough um, and full review. Less than three weeks ago, the country's greatest gymnasts like Simone Biles, Michaela Maroney, and Allie Reisman, representing hundreds of other sexual assault survivors, bravely came forward to detail the horrors they experienced. I don't think people realize how much it affects us. The group blasting the FBI agents, who they say failed to take them seriously, resulting in what the gymnasts describe as dozens of additional preventable sexual assaults. It was like serving innocent children up to a pedophile on a silver platter. Why did none of these organizations warn anyone? We know that these FBI agents have committed an obvious crime. They falsified my statement, and that is illegal in itself. Certain FBI agents broke that trust repeatedly and, and inexcusably. Now, the Justice Department vowing to make up for its initial handling of the cases that resulted in hundreds of women feeling their assaults weren't taken seriously. Now, the inspector general investigated the FBI's handling of the Larry Nassar case and in its report highlighted the FBI agent's failures and recommended they be charged. But the Department of Justice ultimately chose not to prosecute. Lindsay? Ike, thank you. Now to the coronavirus pandemic. Experts say that the U.S. appears to be turning the corner as COVID numbers start to move in the right direction. Meanwhile, a new antibody treatment could soon be on the way to help high-risk Americans who contract the virus. ABC's Rena Roy has the latest. As the U.S. remembers the more than 700,000 Americans now dead from COVID-19, a sign of hope. The CDC predicting that the number of COVID cases, hospitalizations and deaths will continue falling over the next two weeks. In order to avoid any subsequent resurges, it would be very important to get a lot more people vaccinated. Right now, more Americans are getting boosters than first-time shots. New York nurse Sandra Lindsay was the first in the country to get her shot last winter. Wednesday, she got her third dose. It's really a great pleasure to be back here today and to sort of get to the next stage in our fight against this pandemic. And we could soon have even more weapons in the fight against the virus. AstraZeneca asking for emergency use authorization from the FDA of its antibody treatment for COVID-19, which could help prevent disease for high-risk Americans with compromised immune systems. This is not in place of the vaccines. Really important. This is an additional layer of therapy that we have. Meanwhile, 200,000 at-home rapid COVID tests made by the company Alum are being recalled because of an abnormally high rate of false positives. With more COVID prevention measures like vaccine mandates going into effect, the Department of Homeland Security warns the country could see extremists threatening violence against healthcare personnel, facilities, and public officials. Lindsay? Rena, thank you. Now to the political battle in Washington over raising the debt limit to prevent the U.S. from defaulting on its bills. After weeks of stalemate between Republicans and Democrats on working together to avoid an economic disaster, late today, a possible breakthrough. Here's ABC's Rachel Scott on Capitol Hill. Tonight, Senate Republicans and Democrats striking a temporary deal to prevent the American economy from going over a cliff. Hopefully, Republicans will be more reasonable in the next couple of months. The nation will default on its loans two weeks from today. If Congress fails to raise the debt ceiling, it's never happened before, and the potential consequences would be devastating. My Republican friends need to stop playing Russian roulette with the U.S. economy. Earlier today, President Biden, business leaders and top officials sounding the alarm. We would likely experience a recession. Millions of jobs would be lost. Millions of seniors who depend on Social Security for their support would have to make awful choices, such as deciding whether to pay rent or buy groceries. Interest rates would soar. The stock market would crater. J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon predicting a complete catastrophe for the global economy. 
Raising the debt ceiling used to be a standard bipartisan vote, but now Republicans want Democrats to own it heading into the midterm elections. This, although 98 percent of the current debt was created before President Biden took office, 7.8 trillion of it during the Trump years when the parties voted to raise the debt ceiling three times. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell didn't mention any of that today. But the Democrats who run Washington have done nothing. They've squandered week after week after week. Our thanks to Rachel. The Supreme Court today heard a major case involving brutal interrogations at so-called CIA black sites after 9-11 and the government's push to keep some of the details secret. It's the first time the court has taken up a case involving the agency's detention and interrogation program, which some have called torture. For more, let's bring in our Devin Dwyer, who covers the Supreme Court and was at today's hearing. Uh, Devin, tell us what that case is about and, and why it's so significant. Lindsay, a fascinating case. This involves Abu Zubaydah. He was the first al-Qaeda suspect detained and interrogated uh, at CIA black sites after the 9-11 attacks. His treatment in the program has been widely disclosed. A 2014 congressional report that was declassified found he was waterboarded 83 times. He was held in a coffin-sized space for 11 days. He was subjected to sleep deprivation. In the end, the CIA acknowledged that he was not a 9-11 plotter. Um, he offered offered only limited information to those investigators, according to the report. Uh, and Zubaida has been held at Guantanamo Bay Military Prison uh, since 2006. And from there, Lindsay, here's the heart of the case. He's seeking testimony from some of the CIA contractors that interrogated him so that he can bring a claim in Poland, of all places. He wants to sue Polish officials for their complicity, alleged complicity, uh, in those CIA black sites. Now, this, the U.S. government has never Ever confirmed or denied the existence of those sites in Poland. Uh, they say that is top secret information. But Zubaida says he needs expert witness testimony from someone who was there so that he can prosecute these officials. Uh, and now the big question is whether the, at the Supreme Court, uh, whether they'll allow the government to shield that information, to prevent the contractors from testifying, to keep the location secret, or whether Zubaida can actually depose uh, these two former contractors in order to pursue his claim. So it's state secrets, uh, privilege versus the need of this detainee who's been held without charge to bring a case for his treatment, Lindsay. And, Devin, in a surprising turn, several of the justices pressed the Biden administration to let Zubaida testify himself. It was extraordinary, Lindsay. They did a dramatic line of questioning raised by conservative justice Neil Gorsuch. They suggested that allowing the al-Qaeda suspect to testify publicly, something that none of these suspects uh, have had the chance to do, but to talk about his treatment uh, in court could both help his case, but also take the pressure off the government, let those contractors keep those secrets. Here's a little bit of taste of those questions. Take a listen. Will the government make the petitioner available to testify on this subject? We would allow him to communicate about this subject under the same terms as on anything else. The same terms. Look, I don't understand why he's still there after 14 years. I just really appreciate a straight answer to this. Will the government make petitioner available to testify as to his treatment during these dates? If, if the court would like a direct answer to that question, of course. Are you going to permit him to testify as to what happened to him those dates without invoking a state secret or other privilege? Yes or no? So you heard, Lindsay, Justice Gorsuch, Justice Breyer, and Justice Sotomayor all demanding an answer from the government. The Solicitor General, Acting Solicitor Brian Fletcher, uh, said he'd get back to the court about this. But hearing directly from someone who was subjected to treatment at a CIA black site is something that we have not had before. We have not heard that before. Uh, we'll see if the Biden administration gives that a chance in this case. Lindsay? Devin Dwyer, always appreciate your reporting and insight. Thanks so much. Thanks, Lindsay. Now to the former Tesla elevator operator speaking out after he won a $137 million settlement from the company over claims that he faced racist abuse during his time there. ABC's Rebecca Jarvis has more.
We just want to be just treated and seen as equal human beings. A former Tesla contract worker speaking out after a San Francisco federal court decided the electric car maker must pay him $137 million over claims he suffered racist abuse at the company. Owen Diaz, who was hired through a staffing agency in 2015 as an elevator operator at Tesla's factory in Fremont, told the court he faced a hostile work environment where employees drew swastikas and racist graffiti on bathroom stalls, where co-workers told him to go back to Africa, and ethnic slurs were heard routinely. Diaz says nothing was done to stop it, quitting after roughly one year on the job and ultimately suing. They decided not to follow through. They decided to kill investigations. You know, you can't keep treating workers like this. Now, Tesla, whose founder and CEO is Elon Musk, ordered to pay Diaz $130 million in punitive damages and $7 million in emotional distress, an unprecedented amount for racial discrimination cases. A lot of people are living pay paycheck to paycheck. They have to take either choose to take the abuse that these billion dollar companies are putting out or feed their families. In an internal email to employees Monday following the verdict posted on the company's website, Tesla's VP of People writing, although the facts they have of the case don't justify the verdict reached by the jury in San Francisco, we do recognize that in 2015 and 2016, we were not perfect. We're still not perfect, but we have come a long way from five years ago. Hopefully it will make them change and make other companies change and realize racist conduct has no place in the workplace. Our thanks to Rebecca for that. And we turn now to Minneapolis, where George Floyd's death at the hands of a police officer spurred a nationwide conversation. And since then, many in the city are trying to make changes for a better future. ABC's Alex Perez has more. George Floyd's murder spawned the biggest civil rights movement the nation has seen in decades. Here in Minneapolis, the city that saw Floyd take his last breaths, the pain hit deep, but also gave birth to a heartfelt commitment to inspire change. This was designated and redlined as an African-American neighborhood. For Anthony Taylor, with reminders of the young black lives lost all around him, that commitment came on two wheels. We want to get families riding. When he saw the protest that destroyed parts of Minneapolis, he wanted to bring young black kids and black families hope and inspiration. His strategy? Get them on a bicycle. Slow roll, he calls it. The most sinister part of racism sometimes is internalized racism. So really, the bike becomes a symbol of that. We see this as a symbol of owning your mobility. And now we're not just talking about biking. This is about mobility justice as well. It is tied to a greater movement that we're trying to create in this country. Upward movement for families of color and immigrants is what architect Damaris Hollingsworth says she's worked on every day since Floyd was killed. She designed this massive apartment complex in South Minneapolis, making sure it's affordable for those who need it most. Hollingsworth, one of the fewer than 500 black female architects in the entire U.S. I want to do this for the communities who need it most, which is an agenda to offer opportunity, an agenda to offer progress. For Solar Bear Energy company owner Robert Blake, the uprising gave him an extra push to speak up and fight for Native Americans in Minnesota. We're always forgotten people. I would just like to let everybody know that we're still here and, and we matter. He's a tribal citizen of the Red Lake Nation and through his company is helping to outfit tribal lands with solar panels. Most of tribal communities are plagued with poverty. And what we were trying to do is create a power source that will then create revenue for the community. Then off of that will sprawl economic opportunities and entrepreneurial opportunities. Back on the bike, Anthony Taylor's dream, catching speed. Weekly rides now sometimes pull in more than 200 riders. Slowly, he says, turning the wheel of change for Minnesota and the rest of the country. You said it's not only about recreation, but recreation. What does that mean? It means that it's not about biking. The bike is a vehicle for people to recreate their relationship to their community, their relationship to their bodies, their relationship to themselves. 
Our thanks to Alex for that. Now to the holiday shopping season. Yes, right now in early October, Amazon and Target are already offering major deals with supply chain issues caused by the pandemic, creating headaches ahead of the busy shopping season. ABC's Kaylee Hartung has more. The holiday shopping season is kicking off earlier than ever. Amazon now offering Black Friday worthy deals. The online retail giant touting early access to deep discounts across every category. And Target already announcing a holiday price match guarantee and launching their own deal days promotion October 10th through 12th, promising savings on thousands of items online through their app and in their nearly 2,000 stores. It could take a little bit longer, particularly for e-commerce, for things to arrive at your home. October is typically the busiest shipping month of the year as retailers stock up for Black Friday. But three months before Christmas, the supply chain is facing massive disruptions. The pandemic creating shipping issues, shortages and delays. Microsoft can't get the parts to build the new Xbox consoles. It's head of gaming saying there are multiple kind of pinch points in that process. And I think regretfully it's going to be with us for months and months, definitely through the end of this calendar year. Nike's feeling a supply crunch too, working to shift footwear production out of Vietnam where factories are closed because of COVID restrictions to places like China and Indonesia to prevent further delays. Clothing companies like H&M and Boohoo admitting their profits are likely to suffer because of rising supply chain costs and bottlenecks in ports coast to coast. Some retailers trying to alleviate their stress by flying goods in by air freight. Others like Target, Walmart and Home Depot are chartering their own ships and avoiding these backlog ports to make sure they're stocked for the holidays. Our thanks to Kaylee and still to come the historic milestone in the global fight against malaria and a new meaning to saying the saying a picture is worth a thousand words. This is what being live is Please all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. The a family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer cutthroat ink subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. 
Welcome back. We are tracking several international headlines at this hour. The WHO is endorsing the first ever malaria vaccine and recommending that it be given to children across Africa. Scientists say the drug from GlaxoSmithKline could have a major impact, even though it's just 30% effective and protection fades in just months. Malaria kills nearly half a million people each year, nearly half children in sub-Saharan Africa. Sweden and Denmark are putting a pause on using the Moderna COVID vaccine for people born after 1991 because of possible rare cardiovascular side effects. Health officials there said that there was a clear risk, particularly after the second dose for younger age groups, but add that risk is very small. President Biden and the president of China have agreed to hold a virtual meeting before the end of the year. Both men have met before when Biden was vice president. This is all aimed at keeping lines of communication open between the world's two largest economies. Finally, tonight, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, but one artist has taken that a step further, creating art pieces only using words and numbers. ABC's Janine Elliott brings us his story. Dan Duffy spends his days writing, but he's not an author. He's an artist, more specifically, a word artist. I write uh, little tiny letters to make images. Dan meticulously writes out thousands of letters to create illustrations using words and numbers only. I do a pencil drawing, and then all I do instead is have little lines and just kind of chronologically start going over my drawing in uh, pen. And hopefully I don't misspell anything. You know, I went to art school for a reason. The avid sports fan and Philadelphia native got the idea back in 2008 while dating a woman he was trying to impress. And we watched a lot of the Phillies games together and they won the World Series that year. And I thought it'd be cool to remember this old art trick and write all the games from the entire season to create the moment they won. And Dan's plan worked. Jess, the woman he was dating, eventually became his wife. She convinced Dan to start selling the prints and his company, Art of Words, was born. Show you my newest piece is Derek Jeter. Handwritten with the date, score, and opponent from former New York Yankees Derek Jeter's five World Series seasons, containing more than 13,000 letters and numbers. But Dan's art reaches far beyond the world of sports. He creates images of well-known people and moments in history. One of my first pieces was being a, a Philadelphian, I uh, wrote out the Declaration of Independence. I've uh, done uh, Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural national anthem, the words. But for the flag, I chose to do uh, the actual flag of the War of 1812. From history to music, Dan pays homage to some of the industry's most influential artists, handwriting their song titles and lyrics. Bruce Springsteen, we've done Bob Marley, um, My Way with Frank Sinatra. He'd like to work on the band Pearl Jam next, but there's one performer in particular he'd drop everything for. Taylor Swift, Tay-Tay, after Pearl Jam, that'd be cool. Just give me permission, I'll make you look beautiful. Look at those dimples, I'll nail it. While Dan waits for Taylor to call, he'll continue working on his city skylines, some of his favorite pieces to do. In my New York City piece, you'll literally have uh, a street in the Bronx right next to a street in Manhattan, all making a building. But what's most important to this word artist is giving back. His company donates a portion of each sale to charity. We were able to raise $20,000 for various charities last year. And Art of Words is just getting started. I have enough pieces to do, I've calculated for the rest of my life. They take a lot of time, but it's a, a labor of love. Taylor, he's waiting for your call. Our thanks to Janine for that. That is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed